I'm going to warn you that from this point on, things might get a little more scattered than the first two episodes. Throughout this series, I've been doing some timeline jumping here and there for the sake of storytelling. There's a lot going on across the company, and as we roll into the late 90s, things would start branching out even further, because 1998 would mark the year that Dave Halverson left Game Fan. Now, he would stay on as a writer, but that was only to hold him over for a few months while his next project got off the ground. Gamers Republic. Before that, though, we need to talk about Game Fan Online. As the internet became more accessible in the 1990s, it opened up a whole new world for hobbyists of all kinds to connect and share. Naturally, the gaming crowd were ingrained into the early internet culture, and before you knew it, there were dozens of fan sites which would soon be rubbing shoulders with professional ventures into digital games journalism. I'm not sure exactly when GameFan Online was birthed, but I think it was around 1995 or 96, and at that time it was a pretty meager operation. It was basically being run by one or two people, and really just led by Ryan Lockhart, known as Orion. This is where the very helpful Shidoshi comes in. She had been trying to get picked up by various anime magazines when she found herself getting an offer from GameFan. Despite being very passionate, management wasn't happy with how harsh she could be in her reviews, and so they basically moved her towards being a copywriter. Press releases would come in, and she would go through the grueling task of rewriting them word for word for the magazine. A year or two before Shidoshi came on, the magazine had experimented with an anime-focused column called Anime Fan, edited by the contributor Takuhi. This was a pretty inconsistent section, usually only a page or two, reviewing maybe three or four VHS releases if it even appeared in that month's issue. A decision was made to add an anime section to the website, and because Shidoshi was already interested in it and needed a place to actually use her writing skills, she was thrown on to manage the new Anime Fan Online, while she was still retyping press releases. This was probably cool and exciting at first. I mean, she wanted to work at an anime magazine anyway. Then she realized that she had no industry contacts and no experience running a website. She was good at getting info from other places, but had no way of getting scoops herself. Understandably, she didn't want the whole site to just be regurgitated content from other places, so she tried her best to round it out with reviews and other sections. At the same time, Ryan was feeling the same pressures that she was, but magnified trying to run the main site. It didn't help that he was constantly understaffed and had to keep asking for help from the magazine's writers. Eventually, he just stepped down due to the stress, which only really left Shidoshi to run things. So, she becomes the main manager of GameFan's whole online operation. Here's a word to the wise. When you have a real, quote-unquote, major site, don't put somebody with only a minimal amount of experience running a website into that position. The thing that worked into my favor was that, back then, there weren't a lot of people who had experience running websites, so people with little experience could run one and still possibly get away with it. She fully admitted that the site sucked for a while, because she had way too much responsibility, no experience, no industry contacts, no idea how to meet industry contacts, and no idea where to get news. Eventually, she threw her hands up and just started running it like 
a personal fan site. In a funny way, this gave GFO a distinct identity compared to the other notable gaming news sites. It really was just Molly writing about what she wanted, how she wanted. Just like how the magazine always had this ragtag garage band feel to it. She would soon be joined by Bryn Williams, and they found that they got along pretty well, so they just kept doing more of what Shidoshi was already doing. Jun, also known as J-Bomb, also came on to translate the obscure Japanese stuff that no one else was doing. Again, kind of like the main magazine. Things were going pretty swimmingly for GFO for a while, until the whole company had a major shakeup. The reasons for Dave Halverson's departure from GameFan are not super clear. I'm sure if you ask 10 different people, including Dave, you'd get 10 different answers. It's not hard to theorize, though. I mean, it's a miracle that the magazine lasted this long in the first place. And many contributors will admit that they worked without pay for sometimes months on end because they just believed in the spirit of the thing. So remember how I mentioned that shady publishers look to just stuff the shelves with product and get out? Yeah, I can't imagine that that's a very long-term business strategy. Especially when the guy running your magazine is as irresponsible with money as Halverson was. In that Nintendo Life article, Shidoshi says, The ongoing story was the profits from GameFan were being funneled away to fuel other, less successful projects. I know for sure that it often felt like we were sort of a stepchild in the company, as a host of other money-making ventures. Some ridiculous, like the idea of buying thousands of animation cells from random anime thinking they'd bring in good money when resold and attempted magazine launches happened around us. Being honest, it didn't always seem to phase the higher-ups inside GameFan that the staff were constantly not having money, which may or may not be fair. Either way, I think the situation started to deteriorate more, to the point that even Dave and the others at the top were looking for exit strategies. Dave has never shown hesitation in dropping everything and starting a whole new magazine, which I see as both a credit and a fault. Ryan Lockhart has his own thoughts. I think the reason Dave left was because he was no longer having fun. This magazine he created used to be his passion, and now it was a business with a shady partner that only cared about making money. I distinctly remember walking into Dave's office near the end and he'd been crying. I think the realization of everything hit him, and he knew the only way out was leaving this amazing thing he built. And then he was gone. And the outside meetings began. Dave called the staff to a meeting at his house to pitch the idea of leaving everything and starting a new magazine. Most of the people who were there were offered positions at this new venture, and many ended up leaving, but some stayed on. Ryan would say that leaving GameFan, even if Dave wasn't running it, felt wrong. There was an embedded culture in the company, a history and a vibe you couldn't get anywhere else. Or maybe it was like Stockholm Syndrome. Who knows? February 1998 would mark the last issue that Dave Halverson appeared in. After this, the credits would shuffle around for a few issues, and there was a few months gap in between August 98 to January 99. After that gap period, GameFan emerged anew. The credits no longer listed them as being under Metropolis, but Shino Media, a company that seems to have been founded and run by GameFan. Names like Jay Perrier and Jody Seltzer, who had been there for a while, were credited as Shino's managers. I can't really find any info on Shino, besides the fact that they were the publisher of the book starting in 1999. The role of editor-in-chief, or editorial director, was handed to Eric Christopher Mylonis, also known as ECM. The ECM era of game fans signaled a shift in the magazine. With Dave gone, it was a chance to do something new. 
refreshed. That old, inconsistent anime fan column was ripped off of the website and revived in full force by Shidoshi, who turned it into a regular part of the magazine. By the middle of July 1998, it had been fleshed out to not being just a few anime reviews, but also news, manga, soundtracks, live-action Japanese movies, merchandise, just general otaku interests. It was a shame to lose contributors like Terry Wolfinger, whose art would no longer grace the covers, but it seemed from the outside that things were changing with a vision. This also came with a new, much more prickly tone that didn't sit well with everyone. ECM could be very blunt and aggressive in his writing, and for some, that edge was appealing. Others found it mean-spirited. Now that Shidoshi was contributing to the magazine again, a new team would be assigned to Game Fan Online. This leads us to the second management of GFO. There was definitely a push to make the website a bigger enterprise, and the story of that push is told to us by Kevin DeZelms. Kevin was an avid gamer from Colorado. Uh, he was friends with a guy named Jody Seltzer, who, if you recall, ended up at GameFan. Through a series of circumstances, Kevin ended up starring on a show called Twitch, where he played one half of what he describes as Siskel and Ebert for video games. Resident Evil, in my opinion, is what these 32-bit systems are really all about. I think Capcom finally has a break away from the Street Fighter series, and it's really about time. Yeah, let's see, what does this game have? Uh, blood, guts, zombies, <laughs> and snakes, more blood. shotguns. Why would anybody want to buy the game? I know, gosh, it's, uh, it's hard to figure out the popularity of this game. He wasn't super into being on camera, despite the producers liking him, but he said that when he got the chance to sit down with the show's editor and just watch him work, he found his true calling, as he says, hit him in the face like a stack of bricks. Twitch got put in the ground when their satellite was bought out by Fox, but Kevin used it as an opportunity to learn video editing, and he and some friends put together an hour-long videotape called High Definition, dedicated to game industry news. They plan to produce these on a monthly basis and have it get picked up by distributors and video shops. Unfortunately for them, their hopes would be dashed when some Game Informer editors had the same idea as them, and naturally, their tape got picked up first and flopped miserably. After that happened, any hopes of high definition getting picked up were basically kaput. The concept was just dead in the water. As luck would have it, they ran into a producer who was interested in putting them up, but he needed them to make a full 13 episodes of evergreen content, meaning stuff that could be played at any time meaning no news. They were ultimately unable to pull together enough money to get it done, and Kevin thought it was all over. That is, until he reached out to his old friend Jody, asking for a job. Half joking. To his surprise, Jody got him an offer, and he ended up moving from Dead End Colorado to Sunny SoCal to join GameFan's revamped web team. Kevin would use his newfound skill and passion for video editing to cut promos for new games they had lying around the office. These short videos were so successful that publishers and PR people started giving them special early access to games because Kevin was able to make anything look good. I remember IDOS actually requesting that I take an alpha of one of their games, which had almost no enemies in it, and do a video making it look like a winner. I forget what it was, some third-person action game, but after I did it, we got the video exclusive on quite a few games after that, from them. Kevin came on with a guy named Sam Kennedy, who had a very consistent contact in Japan. This meant that they were basically getting news coming in all day. Now, you have to understand something about the internet back then, specifically gaming news sites. No one really knew everything you could 
do with the internet or was even really comfortable wielding it. So every publication at that time ran their websites like they would a newspaper or a magazine. This meant that every site would update once per day, with all the stories coming out at around 6 p.m. West Coast time. There was just no other precedent for news at the time. GFO decided that because they just had info coming in all the time, they just update the website whenever they got it. It seems obvious now because that's how all online news works, but back then this was a crazy revelation that put a lot more eyes on them. You would check GameFan online multiple times a day to see if there were any updates, which only increased their site traffic. The team at this time was made up of Kevin, Kennedy, and Brandon Justice, but they would get help from Thomas Puha, aka Riot, who served them a bunch of European contacts. It got to the point that European publications were actually salty at GameFan because they were the ones getting all the scoops for their region. Shortly after that, Kennedy and Justice would leave for Ziff Davis and IGN respectively, and Kevin was the sole representative for the site. At that year's E3, he pulled major weight, organizing the magazine writers, delegating shifts, and updating the website live from the booth. The site started pulling huge numbers after this, and they brought on a bunch of new staff to shore up their numbers. New staff included Anthony Chow, aka Dongo Head, Jason Weitzner, aka Fury, Levi Buchanan, aka Angus, who was poached from Nintendo Power, Rick Mears, aka The Wanderer, and Matt Van Stone. The site got a redesign to have sections for each big console, headed up by team members who loved them. The site was really hitting its stride at this point. You have to understand that when I started at GameFan, the website was only getting around six to 7,000 unique visitors a day, around the time Shidoshi and then Brandon were running it, more or less alone. When Sam and Brandon left, we were getting around 20 to 25,000 uniques. With the crew I described above, we got up to about 40,000 unique visitors per day, and that's when we decided to branch out into the PC games world. More than just consoles, they brought on Robert Howarth, known as Apache, to add a PC section to the site. This now made them a competitor to places like Voodoo Extreme and Blues News, and pumped their numbers up to 55,000 unique visitors per day. This is right around the turn of the century, like these numbers are crazy, and it looked like they were only going to get bigger. They had a great team, good content, exclusive news, and their own look and feel compared to the magazine and other sites of the day, so why have you never heard of them? What could have possibly gone wrong? So, before GameFan was cut loose from Metropolis, it looks like Dave Bergstein made one last move to cash out before jumping ship. The details are really hard to gather, and I'm not sure exactly what happened, but Kevin refers to it as that deal. That deal, which, in his words, conned IDOS, our closest ally in the advertising sense, out of around $55 million, and used that as an incentive for DVD Express to buy us. Who was DVD Express, or Express.com as they were known? Well, kids, we're going to talk about a little thing called the dot-com bubble. So in the late 90s, people realized that you could make money from the internet. You could make a lot of money, actually. Companies like AOL and Yahoo were looking like the future, and this created what you'd call a speculator's market. Basically, a bunch of different investors see dollar signs in something, and they start buying and pumping money into different projects in the hopes that the one they invest in becomes the next big thing. The problem is that, usually, there wasn't actually that much money to be made to begin with. Turns out there could only be a couple big financial successes in the web space, like... every couple years, maybe? And it also turns out that there wasn't actually that much money to be made in online advertising. So when you put a lot of money into something that makes no money back, 
a lot of people go bankrupt. There was a banker taking a company public, a pretty prominent banker, and he sent me the prospectus for the company, and the company had no revenues. There was no money coming in, like they had no customers, and they were taking it public. And he said, what do you think? And I said, I'm looking out my window, and there is a grandmother on the street with a, with a purse, and I bet if I go mugged her, we could go do it together right now, because that's what you're doing. You're mugging the public. Express.com was trying to be the entertainment super site, and they were gobbling up other websites to try and up their value so they could hopefully open to a huge IPO and make a ton of money. Bergstein pulled some shenanigans to get Express to buy GameFan online, and this led to the eventual downfall of the site. In Kevin's words, Express.com was led by, quote, the most annoying woman on the planet, Allison, who hailed from Variety magazine, and who insisted on using that vernacular in her emails, much to my great irritation. Anyway, unfortunately for Express, they were doing this right on top of the online advertising bubble, and it burst shortly after we moved into their offices in Hollywood. They sold me on the idea of doing a video production department that I would head up, providing video content not only for video games, but also behind-the-scenes packages for films and music on their other entertainment sites. So I turned the reins of GameFan.com over to Levi in anticipation of this video thing, which never materialized. Allison revealed not only this, but that, in fact, I should stop focusing on doing videos and do more writing, preferably news stories which drew those crucial hits. I explained that I'd given up running the site in anticipation of this new role, and now I'm left in a situation where I'm a copywriter. She looks at me straight-faced and goes, Well, that sounds like a career issue to me. Levi told me after the meeting, he saw the look on my face and my death stare at her and thought for sure he was going to see blood. Express started the Game Fan Network, which was an advertising network that tried to get ahead by snatching up a bunch of fan sites. Then that online advertising bubble burst. They couldn't actually pay the fan sites for ads and everything collapsed. This giant behemoth of Express.com just crushed itself while madly scrambling toward an IPO that kept slipping further and further away, while the pressures on us to deliver unreasonable results mounted. Plus, we were now being supervised by an ex-variety writer who knew a sum total of jack and shit about running a gaming website. Our staff was slowly decimated and workloads increased. Eventually, only Levi and Rick were left for the final few weeks, writing product descriptions for Express.com and keeping the shell of GameFan.com alive. But it was over. Now, apparently, when Express.com failed out, Dave Pergstein took the opportunity to buy them? <laughs> he then turned it into a site called DVD.com? which also went bankrupt. Cool move, Dave. Really cool move. GameFan Online would fall sometime around 1999 or 2000, and it wouldn't be much longer before the magazine would join it. It's not, it's over, not yet. over yet. yet. Hellfire! Hell fire. Here comes, Here comes a daredevil! The daredevil. Game, Game over! over.